Hello, <clears throat> can you hear me? Hi. Can you hear us? I can hear you, but you're but you're frozen. Your picture is frozen. Can you see me and hear me? Oh, maybe not. Can you hear us now? Yep. Can you hear me? Uh, Hello. Yeah, there's a there's a delay though. Um, I'm gonna switch to the other network real quick. Okay. Okay. Be right back. Mm. Hi, is that any better? Hi, I can hear you, but I can't see you. Oh, here we go. There you are. Oh, there we are. Okay. This, this hey. connection is much better on this one. I flipped back to, um, cool, guest. It seems like this one is a little stronger. So you can never tell with the day. I, I tell you, it's a little, uh, it's a little crazy. Yeah. But as long as you can hear us. Okay. Yeah. 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 Hi everybody. Hello. So good to see you all. There we go. My that over there. Okay, I'm gonna put us on mute. Okay. And hello, everyone. Thank you all so much for being here today and for still coming to classes and enjoying all of the teachers and the food and the cafe and having wonderful conversations with each other. I miss you all very much. Um, uh, but it, it really does uplift my heart and, um, and bring great joy to me to know that you're all there taking good care of the ashram and of each other. So let's sit tall, we'll close the eyes, take a breath in and a breath out, and just allow yourself to ground into presence to whatever degree you can. And so for some, it may be a very slight difference. It might just be the intention to be present and that can be a very difficult endeavor. For others, maybe you had your yin practice in your meditation this morning and you're feeling super grounded and an additional breath or two just brings that all the more deep, makes it all the more profound. Whatever your experience is in this moment, honor it, accept it, be present to it. And let that level of presence and acceptance be your intention for our session today and perhaps for the rest of your day. Drawing the hands together in front of the heart, we'll lift our voices in one ohm, followed by the invocatory mantras. If you know them, please join. Taking a breath in for ohm. Om. Shri Guru Bhyo Namaha Hari Om Ganana Antwa Ganapati Gam Hava Mahi Kavin Kavinam Upamashravastamam Jestara Jam Brahmanan Brahmanas Pata Anaf Shrinvanu Tibisidhasadhanam Mahaganapataye Namaha Prano Devi Saraswati Vaje Bhir Vajini Vati Dhinama Vitriya Vatu Ano Devo Brahataf Parvata Da Saraswati Ajata Gantu Yagnyam 
Havande vi jujushana gritachi shagman no vachamushati shrinotu vagbevi namaha. And then gently releasing the hands down and fluttering the eyes open. And welcome to another installment of the Wisdom Circle Satsang. So each week we talk about different spiritual topics and you're always welcome to ask questions, ask for clarification. Um, and the only thing that I would remind you is that these sessions are recorded and they do get posted on our YouTube channel and Facebook. So if when it comes time to ask a question, you don't wish to be recorded or included in that posting, just say so and we'll, we'll pause the recording and um, you'll be able to ask your question in privacy, receive a response in, in privacy, and then we'll continue recording after. So always an option. So today I wanted to address um, a, a question that a lot of students ask about their practice. <clears throat> they say, what should I do in my practice? What should my practice entail? And really there's a lot of ways to answer that question. Um, there are many different aspects to a sadhana. So the word sadhana is, is the Sanskrit word for your spiritual practice. And there's many different facets to that. You could have meditation, yoga asana, you could practice yoga nidra, you could practice action, service to the community, you could practice studying scriptures. There's so many, reiki, all types of things. Self-care, true self-care, um, according to Ayurveda, lifestyle, all these are facets of your spiritual practice. And eventually, your practice grows if it's nurtured um, and, and it intensifies. It grows and grows and grows until it includes all of these different techniques on a day-to-day -day basis in every moment, every hour, of your life. Your life becomes your practice and your life becomes full of all of these different techniques as they're needed, as they're needed. But to hear that and, and to think about that can be overwhelming for a lot of students. And so, so the mentality is oftentimes, well, what's the minimum that I can do? Not the minimum because they're not interested, but the minimum because they have not yet gotten beyond the idea that their life is so busy they can't fit a spiritual practice into it. Or they just need a little spiritual practice. What's the li littlest spiritual practice that they can put into their intensely busy schedule and get the most benefit from? And it's a perfectly fine question because that is the way that the human world works is that we're all incredibly busy. And, and it's difficult when we are embedded in busyness and sensory distractions to even begin to explore the thought or the possibility that every single thing in life you do can be filled with your practice. Initially, that's like, no, there's work and there's yoga class. There's family responsibilities and then there's meditation. There's the things I have to do, and then there's the other stuff that I really want to do, but don't have enough time to get to. We have a tendency to break everything into these two categories of have to and should, but don't have enough time because of what I have to do. But the, the student who has been studying sincerely and diligently for a while um, comes to understand that those two categories actually don't exist. They actually don't exist. And what does exist is the story that we tell ourselves. Well, you know, I have to go home and make dinner and clean the house and, and get ready for work tomorrow. I have to go home and do my homework and all these things are in my way somehow. They're in my way. I have all these relationships that I have to fulfill my responsibilities for and, and they're somehow in the way of me deepening my spiritual inquiry, of me deepening my spiritual practice. 
But the reality is those relationships are your spiritual practice. What you bring to those relationships, that is the work that you need to do. And that's the work that is supported by the meditation and the breath work and the yoga asana and the yoga nidra and the self-care and lifestyle. Those relationships are another part of your work. The way you perceive your job and the work that you do at your job, that is another part of your, your sadhana practice. The way that you perceive the most difficult relationship that you have in contrast to the easiest relationship that you have, balancing out those two perspectives so that they meet in the middle, the space of, of a greater loving neutrality, that is your spiritual work, that's your spiritual practice. But still we ask this question because no matter how much that makes sense, absolute practical common sense, we still have to ask the question because we're human. What do I absolutely have to do? Because I'm not ready for all that other stuff yet. So tell me the, tell me, tell me kind of the minimum, maybe a little bit more, and then I'll grow it over time, over time as my life schedule allows. And so to answer that question, we can go to the Bhagavad Gita and read chapter three. So the Bhagavad Gita is one of the primary scriptures from India, what we today call India. The true name for India is Bharat. Bharat means protector. And Bharat is what they called the region or some many parts of that region um, of what today is known as India. Bharat is the, is the original or, or at least uh, one of the earliest names that we know of. Additionally, the wisdom of yoga, the spirituality of yoga is actually called Sanatana Dharma. Sanatana Dharma translates as the eternal truth, the eternal truth. It is a truth that doesn't matter circumstances, doesn't matter how busy your schedule is, doesn't matter how much pain and suffering, joy and pleasure we each experience. The truth is the truth is the truth. And that truth is called Sanatana Dharma. And it is also called the universal way. Um, the way of consciousness. And there is a very long road between here today, where we each are, and that. It's a very long road of practice. It's a very long road of study. It's a very long road. And how do we get there? And how do we get there quick so that our suffering stops? Well, this beautiful scripture called the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna is having a conversation with Arjuna. And in this text, which comes from a much larger text called the Mahabharata, um, it, this conversation between these two is happening on the battlefield. And so Arjuna is a great warrior. He's potentially the greatest archer of his time. And he's heading an army into battle against his cousins and against the current king, which is actually his uncle. And he's doing so because they stole a kingdom from them. Um, they cheated them and they stole a kingdom and they were supposed to give it back after a certain period of time, but didn't. Instead, they said, um, rather than give you even enough land to fit on the tip of a needle, we, we will not give you anything. And in fact, we are going to kill you instead. And so Arjuna and his, his four brothers rounded up all of their supporters and they represent the ethical or virtuous side of humanity. And, and they showed up on the battlefield at a place called Kurukshetra in order to fight this battle, which on the face of it is a battle for a kingdom, but it becomes a battle of virtue, a battle of, of that internal struggle that we each go through in this life, moving from the place of my schedule is too busy. I can't do the things I want to do in my, in my spiritual practice, in my study. I don't have time to be a better person. You know, all those, those types of mindsets and those types of obstacles, it's the battle of those tendencies facing off with the truth that exists within us, the Sanatana Dharma that we're called to, 
the truth of the greater self. And so the Bhagavad Gita is very much a representation of that psychological battle, um, but it's also a historical battle according to many. And, um, and at that period in time, Krishna had, a, a, he was an, an incarnate of Vishnu, the Lord Vishnu, which is the maintainer in the triad of, of masculine deities. And so he was incarnated and he was playing in his humanness, the role of Arjuna's cousin. And being Arjuna's cousin meant that he was also the cousin of this other person that Arjuna was facing off against and his brothers were facing off against. So Arjuna has this dilemma. He comes to the battlefield at Kurukshetra after many things happen. And I'm abbreviating this story greatly. Hopefully some of you are already familiar with the Bhagavad Gita from other conversations, but they come to the day of the battle and Arjuna has Krishna by his side. Krishna is not supporting him in fighting. He said that he wouldn't do that, that instead what he would do would be his charioteer. And that if Arjuna wanted to speak strategy, then Krishna would guide him that way, but he would not actually fight for him. And so this is number one, the instance of you have to show up and do your own work. You can't expect anyone, even God, to do it for you. You can't expect Ganesh to just remove the obstacles out of your life for you. There is some semblance of, of work that you must commit yourself to. And for many, for all students on this path, that is the first few steps, is figuring out what that work is and, and then doing it. And one of the aspects of that work is shifting that mindset away from, my life is too busy, I can't, I can't take one more moment of any of this, um, I need to go practice yoga but I can't, so therefore I'm gonna suffer instead. Shifting from that mindset to the mindset of this is an opportunity to practice. This is an opportunity right now. And if what I do need is to go and practice a yoga nidra, sleep better, eat better, exercise better, uh, practice more kindness, be of more service, then do it. Then do it rather than being stuck in that other mindset of overwhelmedness. So, so that's one of the first things that, that the Bhagavad Gita teaches is that you, Arjuna has to show up. He's got to be the one to do the work, to, to commit to the inquiry. Um, and Krishna will guide him, but he can't do the work for him. So in, in the very first chapter, Krishna is, he's taking Arjuna out onto the middle of the field because Arjuna wants to go out there before the battle starts. And he wants to make an assessment of who showed up. And Krishna is like, well, that's probably not the best idea. You know, maybe we should just do this and, and get it over with. And, and Arjuna is like, nope, nope, take me out there. Take me out there. So Krishna drives the chariot out to the middle of the field. And, and here, you know, it's typical in past times where a battle took place in a bit of a valley and there were hills on each side. And on one set of hills, there would be one side of the battle and the other side, the, uh, the other hill would be the opposer. And so sure enough, Arjuna looks in one direction and sees his brothers and his followers and his everyone supporting him. He looks in the other direction and he sees his cousins and he sees all of the people who are following the current king. And he sees the person and the people who had um, dishonored he and his brothers. But he doesn't see them in a negative, hateful light. Instead, he sees them in the loving memories of their childhood growing up together. He sees them as revered teachers through his developmental years. And he breaks down and he says to Krishna, I can't do this. I cannot, I cannot wage this war. I cannot spill the blood. I cannot do any of this. It's better that they come and kill me than I raise one, one finger to harm them. Now, this is called Arjuna's dilemma. And he says to Krishna, well, we're not going to do this today. And Krishna says, mistake number one, you can't walk away from the work. 
You can't walk away from the work, no matter how uncomfortable the work is. You, this is your dharma. This is where you're meant to be right here, right now, not any place else. You're not meant to be off traipsing through, I don't know, Europe. You're not meant to be at the spa. You're not meant to be at the grocery store. You're not meant to be waiting online for your COVID test. You're not meant to be anywhere except exactly where you are. And that is where the work is meant to be done. And so, so they have, they engage in this conversation and Arjuna starts asking Krishna a bunch of questions, questions like, well, how is it possible that you, you are telling me that, that intelligence and wisdom is, is higher than action, but you want me to take place in this, take part in this battle. You want me to lead this battle. And I don't understand. I don't understand why can't I just be awakened? Why can't I just be enlightened? Why can't I just not do the work? And so chapter three is full of Krishna's answer to that. Why we can't just be awakened. Why Krishna is not going to snap his fingers. Durga's not going to snap her fingers. Christ isn't going to snap his fingers and say, poof, your work is all done for you. So let me read a little bit of this to you. Arjuna said to Krishna, why do you want to engage me in this ghastly warfare? If you think that intelligence is better than action, my intelligence is bewildered by your equivocal instructions. Therefore, please tell me decisively what will be most beneficial for me. So that right there, the first two verses, Arjuna asks, what will be most beneficial for me? He does not ask, what is my duty? He does not ask, how am I of greatest service? He does not ask, how do I serve you best? He says, what's most beneficial for me? So right here, we might be able to recognize this mindset as this inner struggle that each and every one of us go through, where we say, what am I getting for this? What am I getting out of this? How is this affecting me? What is this doing for me? And we don't think very much past that. We stay in a very, what we could call selfish or self-centered mindset. We say, what am I getting out of this? We don't look at the bigger picture. So it goes on, verse three. The Supreme Personality of the Godhead Krishna said, O oh Arjuna, I have already explained that there are two classes of humans who try to realize the self. Some are inclined to understand by empirical philosophical speculation and others by service. So here, Krishna is telling Arjuna that there are basically two paths that most humans will walk. One is the path of, of, of knowledge, it is studying the scriptures, it's memorizing things, it's the mathematics and the, the language and, and the, the, all the fine arts. And, you know, it's learning, learning, learning. And some will take that to an even greater extent and they will study the scriptures and, and they will memorize the scriptures and they will memorize the rituals. So the other side is that people will become caught in action. They will they will serve in some way, shape, or form. They have duties. You know, somebody in the family will go to work in order to put food on the table and keep a roof over the head. <clears throat> somebody will see themselves as a loyal friend. They'll commit to action. And some people will take that even further. And the action that they will commit to will be more selfless, a little bit more selfless. And so maybe they'll go and volunteer at a food kitchen or at the ashram or something along those lines. But they will, they will look at their, their action and their ability to commit to action in a way that moves beyond simply what they're going to get for it. Since so these are the two basic paths, the two basic trajectories that, that humans will take. But he goes on to say in verse four, not by merely abstaining from work can one achieve freedom from reaction nor by renunciation alone can one achieve perfection. So he's telling Arjuna, he's saying, look, 
you can commit yourself to memorizing every single scripture that there is and to not doing any other work in the world. But that's not enough. That's not going to answer your query. It's not going to bring you to the place of self-awareness and enlightenment. Additionally, one can <coughs> renounce the fruits of their actions. They can work, 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 and just keep working for the sake of working. But they're not going to attain any kind of perfection there because there's still something missing. There's something missing from both of those scenarios. In today's world, we have a lot of people who study, 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 which is a fantastic thing and by all means study rather than not. But the number one reason why so many people are studying is so that they can have uh, interesting yoga classes to teach so that they can make money. Now, somewhere along the way, what they're studying touches their soul and their heart and changes maybe some part of their temperament or their tendency. We don't know when that's going to happen or if it'll even be in this lifetime. Somewhere along the way, the work that they're putting in will have a, a, a beautiful effect for them. But the reason why many people undertake that work is, is not for the sake of spiritual awakening. It's actually for the sake of commercialism. And that's unfortunate because that delays any spiritual benefit that one would get. And it's, it's indicative and evidence of the absence of the third path of yoga. So the first path, Jnana yoga, the yoga of knowledge and wisdom, <clears throat> which most people simply equate to studying the scriptures and the mantras and the rituals. So much more than that, though. This third one goes beyond the karma yoga. And karma yoga is the yoga of action. And some people say, well, it's, it's selfless service. So just do good work in the world. But there's something more to it than that. There's the third path, which is bhakti yoga. And what Krishna is telling Arjuna is that, yes, go ahead, be involved in jnana yoga. Absolutely. Study the scriptures, get to know the mantras, study, 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 memorize, memorize, memorize. Go ahead and, and do your actionable duty. Do what it is that you're meant to do in this life. But in both those instances, in both those instances, surrender all of it as devotion. Surrender all of it infuse all of it with devotion. In the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says devotion to me. So devotion to Krishna. But whether you follow Krishna or Shiva or Durga or Kali, whatever it is that you're doing, whatever it is that you're studying, see it as a service to that, as an offering to that. You can imagine in your mind that that you know that Mother Durga is happy when you read her scripture. It makes her happy because it means that you're involved and interested in relationship with her. So you can imagine in your mind and in your heart that that this is what I'm doing. This is my offering to you. This is how I'm coming to know you. Is that I'm going to not only read your book, the Devi Mahatmya, but I'm also going to read it. With, with a sense of devotion. I'm going to in, infuse love into every moment of learning. I'm going to look at the time that I'm spending with this as, as my offering to you. What else would I be doing? People have often asked me in the past, they say, why is that all you do? Why don't you like, you know, go out to the bar for happy hour with, you know, your friends or whatever? Why, why is that? Why do you just like stay at the ashram? Why do you read, study so much? Why do you practice so much? And say, well, what else would I be doing? Really? What, what else would I be doing? I can go hiking. That'll be my devotion. I can go gather with friends. That'd be my devotion. I can 
I can be kind to strangers. That's my devotion. Everything is tied up in the devotion. And so as everything becomes more and more tied up in the devotion, we lose the tendency and, and we could even call it the human necessity to categorize things as that's work, that's family, that's friend, that's a night out on the town, that's vacation. We see it all as a single flow of devotional union and an opportunity to serve, an opportunity to make offering, an opportunity to, to experience blissfully the gift that we've been given in this life. There's many layers to it, you know, many layers to it. But basically, we don't look at today and say, oh, God, I can't wait to get to next week. We look at today and say, today. What can I do today, right now? And how can I take whatever this mundane action is that I'm involved in brushing my teeth, brushing my hair, painting a wall, walking in nature. How, how do I transform this human mundaneness into the understanding that this is just as sacred as anything else? And if I do not see God here, then I will not see God anywhere. I'll, I'll claim I do. I'll claim I do when I, if I go to church on Sunday and, and sit in front of the crucifix, I'll claim to, to be there for God. But if you can't see Christ in the blossoming flower or in the bee that's hovering in front of your face, buzzing at you, or, or in the homeless person on the street, then how do you see God in church hanging on a cross? The understanding in that instance is very, very minimal. It's very minimal. If we only come to identify Christ as something that was crucified. There's a beautiful parable about Shiva. There's a king and the king claims to be one of the greatest Shiva devotees. And so Shiva would go meet him every once in a while. You know, I guess they drink tea together or something. And, uh, and the, the, the king once again said to Shiva, I am your biggest devotee. I absolutely adore you. No one adores you more than I. And so Shiva sat there and he said, well, so you would know me. You would know me. I mean, I could show up as a dog and you would know it was me. And he said, absolutely. I would know you if you showed up as a weed in my garden, I would know you. And he said, oh, okay. Well, that's, that's very nice. Thank you. Thank you for your devotion. So a day came and it was a Shiva Ratri, which is the, the blessed day of Shiva that happens every March or thereabouts. And the king was throwing this huge parade in honor of Shiva to show everybody his devotion and how he was Shiva's greatest devotee. And all of, of you know, the preparations were so grand and there were hundreds, thousands of people lining the streets waiting for this parade to come. And the king is standing there <clears throat> in this area, which is cordoned off and a bit more prominent than anybody else's area, because after all, he is the king. And so he's got to show everybody who he is. Somehow, this homeless man ended up inside of this restricted area and ended up right next to the king. And the king caught a, a whiff of him because he smelled rather badly. And he turned to him and in disgust, he said, you do not belong here. You go back behind those lines now before I have my guards remove you. And the man looked at him and said, oh, oh, good sir. I'm so sorry. I just, I, I love Shiva. I want to be here. And where better to be to celebrate this amazing day than by your side, Shiva's greatest devotee. And the king said, you stink, you're dirty, get away from me. And the man looked at him and he said, you are Shiva's greatest devotee in this entire universe. And you would throw another devotee of Shiva away. 
because you find his odor offensive. And in that moment, the king looked at the beggar and saw the beggar staring straight in his eyes and calling him on his hypocrisy. And the king fell down onto his knees and he started bowing. He said, Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya, Shiva, Shiva, I see that it is you. I see that it is you and I have been a hypocrite in the way that I have professed my faith to you, my devotion to you. So that story is for each and every one of us to recognize that we too often times say one thing but do another. Our actions and our intentions don't align. And if we, if we read through chapter three, which is only 42 verses, it's not very long. If we read through chapter three of the Bhagavad Gita, we'll find some very informative answers to how to move along our spiritual path so that we are less hypocritical and more sincere in marrying together our study, our action, and our devotion. The three aspects of a beautiful bow, right? You have the left loop, the right loop, and what ties them together. You have the study, you have the action, and you have the devotion, tying it all together. So let me read a little bit more of this chapter for you. Everyone is forced to act helplessly according to the qualities he has acquired from the modes of material existence. Therefore, no one can refrain from doing something, not even for a moment. One who restrains the senses of action, but whose mind dwells on sense objects, deludes themselves and is called a pretender. On the other hand, if a sincere person tries to control the active senses by the mind and begins a karma yoga sincerely, without attachments, he is by far superior. Now, he doesn't mean superior as in better than. He means that he, he is in the process or she is in the process of that awakening that is so sought after, not fooling themselves. They're actually doing their work. Perform your prescribed duty, for doing so is better than not working. One cannot even maintain one's physical body without work, the work of the heart, the lungs, the cells of the body. Work done as a sacrifice has to be performed. Otherwise, work causes bondage in this material world. Therefore, Arjuna, perform your prescribed duties for divinity only. And in that way, you will always remain free from bondage. And here, what he's suggesting is that we tend to get caught up in the idea that I'm doing work for you. There's nothing in this for me. We become caught up in the resentment and the, the begrudging nature of, of resentfulness when <clears throat> that is a form of, of suffering that, that we bring about on our own. If there's an issue with something you're doing in your life, with your job or something like that, if there's an issue there and you're truly unhappy being exploited or something like that, then leave. Then, then don't stay and, and maintain the harm to yourself. If you're in a relationship, don't stay and maintain harmfulness, no. But if you're just complaining for the sake of the drama, get over it. Because it's not serving you. It's just giving you something else to talk about, something else to complain about that's keeping you from the thing that will actually serve you best. He goes on to say, in the beginning of creation, the Lord of all creatures sent forth generations of humans and of demigods along with sacrifices and bless them all by saying, be thou happy by this yagna, this sacrifice, because its performance will bestow upon you everything desirable for living happily and achieving liberation. 
the demigods being pleased by these rituals will also please you. And thus by cooperation between humans and demigods, prosperity will reign for all. So if we take the time to make the offering, if we take the time to see our life as a service to the greater good, to the reduction of suffering, then our life will be a happier place. But if we see things that we do on a day-to-day -day basis as a pain in our ass, as something to be dissatisfied and complain about, and it's everybody else's fault, but hey, I'm not, it's not my fault, but it's everybody else's fault. And that's just going to lead us down the rabbit hole of suffering. And that suffering is addictive. It's extremely addictive. And before long, it becomes so addictive that we forget even more deeply that we actually have the ability to pull ourselves out of that rabbit hole and to change the direction of the very nature of our mentality that we can say, actually, there's a lot of opportunity here for me to be of service. There's a lot of opportunity here for me to, to practice my practice this is my practice. This is it and, and nothing else. He goes on to say a little bit later in the chapter, <clears throat> all living bodies subsist on food grains, which are produced by the rains. Rains are produced by performance of yagna and yagna is born from prescribed duties. Those prescribed duties that are found in the Vedas, the yamas and the niyamas, um, all of the virtuous behaviors. Regulated activities are prescribed in the Vedas and the Vedas are directly manifested from the Supreme Personality of the Godhead. Consequently, the all-pervading transcendence is eternally situated in these acts. So here Krishna is telling Arjuna, look, you're going into this battle thinking that this is for you. You're going into this battle thinking that you're gonna suffer. You're either gonna suffer the the loss of their lives or you, of the, or the loss of your own or the loss of your kingdom or you're going to suffer because you get your kingdom back and you don't really want it but whatever it is everything that you're doing right now you're doing because you're dissatisfied you're not looking at this as fighting this battle is correcting a corruption you're not looking at this as service as um, taking action as an offering. Now, some people would say, well, are you saying that he should fight a war where people get killed as an offering to, to divinity? That's kind of messed up. And you to look at it a certain way, we can say, if it helps to understand it all, these individuals have said that they're going to kill him and his brothers. Whether they show up for war or not, whether he picks up his bow and arrow or not, the cousins are hell-bent on ridding the earth of Arjuna and his brothers. They should just stand by and let that happen. When their dharma is to bring to life the virtues and to bring the kingdom back to a place of golden prosperity as an offering to Krishna. So it's not for them to commit to a war out of hate, jealousy, greed, fear, or any of those types of things, which is why every single war that has ever happened in this world has happened. Those are all unjust wars, even if they've been held in the name of God, as many, many wars have been. Those are not correct wars. Those are wars based on hate. Those are wars based on, I'm going to annihilate you because you're different than I am. But this war needs to be fought by Arjuna, but in a different mindset, 
it needs to be fought because it's the correct thing to do, even though it's uncomfortable. And we can look at that from the psychological side of it and say, it's a direct reflection of, of our own spiritual practice in this life that we need to do our practices. We need to advance in our practices because it's the right thing to do. If our spiritual intention is the alleviation of suffering of self and others, we are not going to escape the uncomfortable. You break your arm, it hurts when you break it, but it hurts even more when it's mending. But then after it mends, you have a bone that's even stronger than it initially was. So you have a life that is broken or that you perceive as being broken. Then do the work of mending and allow your life to mend into something far stronger, far more profound far happier doesn't mean you're not going to have hard times. It doesn't mean that you're not going to have moments of distress and distraughtness. Of course you are. We all do, but you'll know what to do with them a little bit more. You won't be as victimized by them. Instead, you turn your mind to service and to offering. You say, I will do the, the work of this healing as an offering to whatever avatar of divinity it is that you adore and, and give it away that way. Okay. And so let's ask any questions or reflections at this point. Can you hear us? I put the volume back on. Yes. Yep. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Just talk a little bit louder so I can hear you. And who is that? Because I can't see that far. It's Noel. Hello, Noel. Good to see you. Um, so um, as you were talking about like the flow of things that it will just go in everyday life, you know, and in order to do to get to that point, I feel like well, you're gonna have to have practice. So, you know, and sometimes when you feel like off kilter a little bit, sometimes I say to myself, well, okay, I need to do something here because I'm like too hyper or I'm too whatever, but it would be really nice. And this is just my thought, to have like a list <laughs> that's written like, okay, well, I have to pick from, all right, let's do this. Sometimes I'll read. Sometimes I know I can sit up and do some yoga, you know, sometimes, um, you know, like volunteer, things like that, but I think it'd be nice, and I don't know if it's in that chapter three you're talking about, to have a nice list and just make sure you're doing it so many of them every day. And eventually, I guess it would turn into the flow. I mean, is there a list that you can devise from somewhere? Or, I mean, me myself could, or, um, you know, it'd be nice to just have everything at once that you just, and then the practice of it becomes every day. Mm -hmm. um, well, you're, you already do have your list. It's just maybe not written out. Um, all the, all the go-to things that you do, uh, whether it be your yoga practice or breathing or, um, or just grounding your feet into the earth or, um, hugging a tree or stopping by church or temple or ashram, whatever, whatever it is that you're finding comforts you in those moments write each one of those down and make a list for yourself. And then you can look and say, also, you can add to that. And, and some of the things that you can add to that are um, good, healthy food. What are you consuming? Um, how often are you praying, chanting? Um, you can add to that uh, time in nature, uh, time laughing, with maybe children or grandchildren or friends. Um, you can add to that good choices. Somebody calls and says, hey, martini hour, five o'clock, meet me there. And you're like, I don't really want to go, but you know, maybe because otherwise they'll be mad at me. Get rid of that second part. 
and stick to good decisions. If you if you know, um, number one, that you know alcohol is not something that you should partake in because it leaves you feeling crappy, or two, you're just not interested in it, but you do it only to go along with the group, then correct that behavior. And you can apply that, and we can all apply that to so many behaviors. So, so inquire of yourself, um, and that's a very big practice. Inquire of yourself, what is it that I'm agreeing to do and doing for the sake of, of other people liking me or their satisfaction or out of fear, and then correct those behaviors. And so just continue your list. Um, in Ayurveda, there's something called Dinacharya, and there's also Ritucharya. And those are daily rituals and, and seasonal rituals. And um, I'm trying to think of what would be the best. There's actually a book called Dinacharya that you could get. That's D-I-N-A-C-H-A-R-Y-A. -A. Um, and in there, uh, it says, these are things that you should do every day. These are things you should do every day, like um, Abhyanga, which is oil massage, um, eating proper food at the proper time, um, how to plan out your day. Um, so that would be, that would be something that you could do too, is do a little bit of research into Dinacharya or Rituchariya, which is R-I-T-U-C-H-A-R-Y-A um, for the daily and the seasonal practices. Um, but you're correct, Noel, because eventually what ends up happening is let them be your go-to, no matter how frustrated or doubtful a mind or a heart might be just keep going to them more and more and more. And eventually they become what you do all the time and you don't even need to think about it. And, and then also hold the space for yourself to evolve so that these practices move from being reactive only, right? So like right now in a lot of people's lives, practices are, are um, they're a reactive um, re they're a reactive, what do they call that? It's like, they give you, they give you, um, when you have asthma, they give you an inhaler that is a reactor, right? So like you're having an attack and then you take it. They also give you an inhaler that is a preventative that you utilize in order to not have that attack. So what is your spiritual practice? Is it a preventative or is it a reaction? So we want to we want to evolve away from the reaction and toward the preventative, but then we want to evolve even more. And so it's not a reaction to life being difficult, and it's not a preventative, so life won't become difficult because it's going to anyway. Um, but it is done for the sake of being alive. Period. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 Great. yeah. Great question. Really great question. Any other reflections or questions? Yes. Hello, Savannah. How are you? I can see you. You're a little closer. <laughs> um, I just wanted to reflect on a few of the things that you said because this Rhythm Zone with A has helped me to put a few things into perspective that I have been um, struggling with. Um, uh, one of the first things that you said about doing the work that you have to do instead of dwelling on the things that you want to do or the things that you could, could, could be doing instead. And I, I've known for a while now that <clears throat> a lot of my work in this life is like healing emotional um, trauma and like the, the physical manifestations of that trauma, but I have the tendency to compare my life to other people's lives and and play this why me game. Why do I have to do this? Why do why why do I have to heal from all of this when other people can go out and, and live their lives freely or carefree? You know, and from my standpoint, I always put myself in this position where I, I like to, I guess you could say pity myself and, and think that I have it so much worse than everyone else. And 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 I feel like envy towards the people who can 
live without this work, but this this has helped me to realize that as painful as it is, this is my work in this life, and this is what I have to do. And um, that that was really helpful to me. And also what you said about um, the parable with Shiva, I think you said, um, about seeing God or divinity and everything also helps to put this in perspective to to see divinity in my work as well as painful as it is and as hard as it is to be able to see that that's God as well and that was really helpful so thank you I'm so I'm so grateful um I'm so grateful that you you come every week you know and you've been doing such beautiful work you truly have and 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 you you have in spite of whatever fear may have been there you're diving in anyway and and that is that is probably the hardest obstacle is is the fear right of of well i know the pain i'm in now but i don't know the pain i could be in later so i i'll stay with what's familiar but you said no you said yes to something else you said whatever it is that's going to come i'll i'll meet it face to face and so i'm i i honor you for that and i'm very grateful um for your awareness and you know it's interesting because i think that anybody who has had um a trauma in their life they have there is a tendency and even if people have an if people have an illness you know if if they're diagnosed with something the tendency for human beings is to look at other people and to say, why me? Why, why me? And, and then to look at other people and to picture their lives as, as something picturesque and perfect or near perfect, or just more perfect than, than, you know, our life and what we're going through, but nobody's life is perfect, you know? everybody has there's a there's another really great parable of a woman who lost her baby and so she was so distraught um she lost her her young baby and she went to lord yama and yama is the lord of death right and she went to him and she said i i will become your disciple i will i will chant and pray to you day and night endlessly just give me my child back because my heart is breaking and I, 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 I can't do this. I can't feel this way. I can't go on. You need to give me my child back. You made a mistake. And Lord Yama, while he had great compassion for her and he, he tried to tell her, I can't give you your child back. I'm sorry. Your child is no longer of this realm, but she wouldn't hear him. She wouldn't hear him. So finally he said to her, okay, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm not supposed to do this, but I think that there might be a way around, around the rule that I can't give you your child back. This is all you have to do. Go house to house, knock on every door. And when you have knocked on every door, And you've asked them if they is anybody in that house who has not lost somebody to death. Bring me a mustard seed, one mustard seed from one house, and I will give you your child back. And so she thought, oh, my God, totally. There's somebody in the world. She goes door to door to door to door to door. And probably a few years later, she goes back to Lord Yama and he says, do you have my mustard seed? And she said, no. And I understand. And then she continued with her life and the Dharma that she was meant. So, so the, the moral of, of that story is that there are struggles for each and every one of us. And that is the work for each and every one of us. And so to say, look at that person over there, they have it easy. They have a nice car, they have a house, a roof over their head, but you don't know what's going on under the surface. You don't know what's being hidden and what's being hidden well. 
You don't know what's being denied. We, we just don't know. And so, so to look at ourself and look at another person and say, I wish I was them, we don't even know what we're asking for. We could be asking for something that we can't even imagine, something so horribly sufferable, suffering. Um, so, so best we do our own work and leave the work of other people to other people. And if we can be a support to other people in a reasonable way and as an offering to, to that, then go that route. Because in the end, loka samasta suki no bhavantu. May all beings everywhere be peaceful and free from suffering. And may my thoughts, my words, and my actions have something to do with that. Yeah. Thank you both for your, for your comments and questions. Anybody else before we end for today? Any other reflections or questions? Yes. Who is that in the back? I can't hear. Come up a little bit closer. Yeah. It's Jules. Hello, Jules. How are you? Oh, so good to see you. Um, yeah, I was just reflecting on um, the story you told about the battle, um, how they were just kind of uncomfortable with fighting a battle that, you know, like they were committed to maybe nonviolence and they, but then the battle involved defending nonviolence um, and fighting against injustice. And as a person who's like committed my life to fighting injustice in different ways, I just like, I honor them for doing that. And I honor me and my comrades and my people like for doing that so constantly because it is like uncomfortable and it's so, it's sometimes so hard to fight fiercely against injustice when it feels like, um, well, I just wish I wouldn't have to fight. You know, I wish this violence didn't exist or yeah. this injustice didn't exist. Yeah. So I didn't have to commit against injustice. Um, and, and also it's so hard when like the people who are committing the violence, like those cousins, are known by the world to not, to just be the norm, or it's just been the accepted thing for so long that um, the people fighting the injustice are also labeled as violent or wrong. Yeah. So um, I just got a lot out of that story and I like send my, send my honor to those who keep going no matter what. Absolutely. Or, or Thank you so much, Jules. What a beautiful reflection. And yes, 100%. Um, you know, Gandhi, um, if you ever watched the movie about him, there was a time he, he went away to London, I think it was, to go to college. And then he came home and there were a lot of things that were going on in India at that time. And and the, the Hindus were being um, treated as a subservient class of of non-humans literally um and they weren't allowed you know they were treated very much like like blacks have been treated in this country right you know they're not allowed to come in the front door they're not allowed to walk down the main sidewalk they have to take the alleyways and the back roads they're not allowed to eat in the same restaurant with highfalutin europeans and things like that and he's he came home to this and he saw this you know, and he was he was walking through um, a, a village area uh, that had a main street, alleyways, and then back roads. And he's walking down the main street, and his friend who he's walking with says, "We can't walk down the street here. We have to go back." And there were some police officers in front of him, some I guess European uh, English police officers. And he he says to him, "You know, we have to go down that alley and take the back road." Um, and and Gandhi looked at him and said. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. I am no less than they are and I am no more than they are. 
if they're able to walk on the street, and I'm paraphrasing, but basically if they have the right to walk on the street, I have the right to walk on the street. We all need to walk in harmony and to hide, to hide from, from the denial of that is just as wrong as the individual denying me the right to walk on the street. So big statement there, right? Huge statement there. To, to hide from the truth of injustice is just as appalling as the injustice. And that we need to find a way to stand up together for what is correct, for what is right, and for what is unifying. Not for what is egotistically good. There's gonna be some of that because we're all human, but we, we, we would be benefited greatly if we could find the, a way to accept each other truly as, as equals. You know, the constitution of the US, all men are created equal. Well, it's actually all human beings and all beings are equal. We are all the same consciousness. We are all interconnected. And, and our life, whether we accept the challenge or not, is in some way, shape, or form being lived in order to discover the truth of that and to live the truth of that and to share the truth of that. So my, my hat always goes off to individuals who are involved in in nonviolent protests and in um, in standing up for what is right and understanding also that sometimes you need to stand a little more firm than others and it it may not always be nonviolence sometimes it's self defense you know I'm not going to say much more about that right now because we're at our time but um, but yeah it's hard work it's absolutely hard work. But let's start with the self too, you know, and look at the self in the mirror and say, in what ways do I tread on you? In what ways you're talking to yourself in the mirror, look at yourself in the mirror and ask yourself, in what ways am I unjust to you? In what ways are, is, would, are my behaviors unjust to myself? And, and then start correcting from there also, because we all we all behave unjustly to ourself. And, and then we get angry with ourselves over it. And so we behave unjustly to others because we think it's compensation somehow for being unjust to ourselves. I don't know, maybe we're just really confused, but, um, but yeah, we have to start somewhere. And many of us can start in multiple places, but, but most of us probably need to start um, at home and the way that we look in the mirror. And then retrain ourselves the way we think the way we perceive the way we attach the way we attack the way we um the way we live and then that will branch out into so many other aspects of life the solution is really simple but getting there is uncomfortable as hell and we don't like discomfort we don't like discomfort the ego doesn't like discomfort, doesn't like throwing away everything it thinks of itself, you know? All right. So any, any other last minute questions or reflections right now? We're good. Okay. Let's sit tall. We'll close the eyes. Take a breath in and a breath out. May all beings everywhere be peaceful and free, and may our thoughts, words, and actions have something to do with that. Draw the hands together in front of the heart, and we'll chant one Om. Oh. Harry Om. Jay Mata D. Thank you all so much for being here today. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday. If you haven't had brunch yet, I understand it's an amazing meal today. I'm over here 
wishing that somehow Casey could fly me over a little meal from the kitchen. I so miss Linda's cooking and everybody's cooking in the kitchen. Um, so enjoy, enjoy, and enjoy some more. And I'll see you all next week. Thank you.